Didn't I tell you it was a crazy kind of lesson we had from Acts this morning? Same author wrote both Acts and the Gospel of Luke. And I don't know if anyone has ever decided to preach on this on Stewardship Sunday, but this does not come up in the lectionary. It doesn't come up anywhere. But I found, um, and I did more research on this passage, I think, than I've done on anything since seminary, because it's a hard one, isn't it, the story from Acts. But I found this great thing from a blog that a pastor wrote. His name is Pastor Bob. So this is from Pastor Bob's blog. That's all I know about Pastor Bob is that he has a blog. He said, this is the epic Stewardship Sunday fail number 17, Ananias and Sapphira Sunday. He says, ideally, the service should be held in the graveyard adjacent to the church building during a cold, misty drizzle. The pastor processes out of the church, service followed behind with garden spades. The congregation shuffles, hands in pockets. The pastor begins the call to worship. The pastor says, the Lord gave 10 plagues. The people respond, the Lord gave 10 commandments. The pastor said, the Lord gave 10 lepers health. The congregation responds, the Lord is a perfect 10. And the pastor says, what shall we return to the Lord in return for his kindness? And the congregation says, we shall give our 10%. All hold out their wallets and checkbooks, etc. as Acts 5 is read. During the readers, the servers shall clang the garden spades together after the phrases, he fell down dead and she fell down dead at his feet and died. After the reading, the pastor says the word of the Lord, to which I'll respond, thank God it wasn't us. To which the pastor responds, but it might be next time. Then the collection is taken. Glad to hear you laugh a little bit after that passage. It is a tough one, isn't it? And it would be easy to stand up and say, if you don't fulfill your estimate of giving, guess what? You're done, just like the kid in the Sunday school story that I told you in the joke this morning, the Miss Edna says, you know where little boys go? He knew, didn't he? You go to the arcade, you go to McDonald's, you go to the movies. Now, I don't know what compelled Ananias and Sapphira to do what they did, but maybe they thought, well, you know, they sold this, pass this parcel of land, they got money, and then they looked at it and they decided, hmm, you know, we could use some of this for the temple giving, we could give some of this to the poor, we could go to the arcade, we could go to McDonald's. You don't know what they were thinking. But in order to understand this passage, I think we have to look at what um, the passage before it says, because it begins with but, that, you know, but Ananias and Sapphira. So what happens before the but? That was this man named Barnabas, who had sold a piece of land, gave the proceeds to the apostles to divide among any as they had need. That was the beginning of the church. It says, all the believers were of one, one heart and soul and held all their property in common. Now, please don't go to politics with this one. This is way before there were Democrats or Republicans. This is way before capitalism. This is way before anything else. This was based on the Mosaic Covenant community and the call in scripture for people to care for the widows and the orphans, to care for the poor in their midst. That was not optional. But in this case, what they gave was optional. Because Peter says to Ananias, and let me say first, this is not the same Ananias we studied in Bible school this year, Ananias who healed Paul when he was blind. Because we know that for a fact, because this Ananias died before that Ananias came on the scene in scripture. But they were given the choice. They could sell the property or not sell the property, and they could do with it what they wanted to do. They could give part of it. They didn't have to give all of it, but they committed themselves to giving all of it possibly because they wanted to look good in front of everyone else, which ties us to the gospel lesson in very many ways, because Jesus, we read just a little passage of that this morning, but what Jesus had said before this happens, the sort of but of the, the Lucan passage this morning, Jesus is saying to the people about their inability to care for others without even saying that because he had been sitting there watching the rich people go to the temple and put in great sums of money. And he had just confronted them with the fact that they would let their parents, their elderly parents, literally starve in the streets rather than support them by saying, oh, my gift is korban, which means my gift is dedicated to God. So they could go in front of everyone else and make their grand offerings. And so when Jesus says, this woman in her poverty has put in everything she had to live on, what he's really doing is shaming them for allowing someone to live in such abject poverty in their midst, which is a direct violation of God's law. Now, when you put that together with our call to worship, we're really confused, aren't we? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. 
and the disciples, in the words of Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message, as they were staggered by that. These are staggering passages, aren't they? Now, we could just say, you have to unload your camel, because there is that, and I've talked about that before, I think, in, in a sermon uh, last year or the year before. I can't remember where we are anymore in the COVID generation. But there's sort of a myth that goes around that says there is a, a wall in Jerusalem that has a gate that's called the camel's eye. And in order to get in there, you have to unload your camel to get it through. That's not true. It wasn't true at this time anyway. Now they sort of put that name on one of the gates. Now, I could preach a sermon that says, if you want to get into heaven, just offload some of your wealth as the offering plate comes around or in the box at the back. That's not what this is about. Same thing, like I said, with the passage from Acts. We could say to you, oh my goodness, give or die. That's not a good stewardship sermon, is it either? We could even go with a woman who gave everything she had and say, no gift is too small, and everyone goes, thanks be to God on that one, right? That's if we take all these to be about money and we take all these to be about possessions and things like that. So we have to ask ourselves, what do these passages mean? And I wrestled with this one all week. Now, I decided to preach on this a few weeks back, and then I decided, I don't think I want to preach on that. Kara and I were talking, and I said, what would you call a sermon if you preached on these two passages in particular? And she said, how about tight fists and open hands? I thought, that's pretty good. But I decided, on uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh oh, because I'm not sure what it means for me, but I'll tell you what it comes down to for me. And we talked about it. If you come to the nine o'clock service, you have to answer back. And everybody sat there, sort of squirming, and finally said, "Well, maybe it's talking about this." But let me tell you this, and we don't know in this passage. It's very unclear to us, isn't it? How many of you think God killed Ananias and Sapphira? You don't think God knocked him dead? Neil thinks God's the one who went zap. I agree with some of the passages and some of the commentaries I read that said they think they died of shock and embarrassment, that he had a heart attack when confronted with his own sin. His sin was not withholding money. His sin was lying about it. His sin was trying to look so good to other people that he said, I'm going to sell this piece of property and give it all to the poor. Like I said, that's not optional in Scripture. The law in the Old Testament again and again says, you shall care for the widow, the fatherless, you shall care for the orphan, you shall care for the poor, you shall care for the sojourner in your midst, because once you were slaves in Egypt, I am the Lord your God. Anything that's punctuated with I am the Lord your God, I've always said gets my attention right up front. And we know that Jesus was pointing out to the men around him who were watching this woman give everything she had. Not because she's not commended because she's giving everything away that she owns, because how many of us could do that, honestly? How many of us do you think could just clean out your bank account and put it in the offering plate? Or not just here, or take it to Goodwill or another organization that feeds people. Take it to the Salvation Army and turn it over. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not asking you to give all your money here. But I want you to hear what this passage is really saying and what it really says to you. I'll tell you what it says to me. It tells me I need to trust God more. And if we think we're better than this, if we think we wouldn't do this, I want you to think back to the beginning of the COVID epidemic. What could you not find in any grocery store on the planet? Toilet paper. You would have thought it was made of gold, wouldn't you? Now, at the beginning of the pandemic, I just happened to go into Target one day and toilet paper was on sale. I live by myself. I don't need a whole lot. But they have had this mega pack of toilet paper, buy one, get one free. And I thought, I will never use that much up in my lifetime. But it was free, so I took it. It was so big, it was this tall. Because it was like a 30-pack roll package. I had two of them. I had it in the back of my car because I couldn't find a place in my little house big enough for this thing, a toilet paper. I didn't have a closet that it would fit in. It wouldn't even fit my garage because that's where everything else I owned was at the time. And I had it in the back of my car, and a friend of mine said, why do you have toilet paper in the back of your car after the pandemic started? I said, because I can't fit it in my house. He said, somebody's going to break your window and steal that. Sure enough, somebody did visit my house and steal my toilet paper. I was amazed. One of my guests left, and I looked in my closet, and where I had once had six rolls, there was one left. And if you think that's just an exaggeration, wait till it starts snowing and you try to buy a loaf of bread in this town. God's trying to tell us something here, to say, if we are less anxious about what we will have for ourselves, we'll be more willing to share it with others. 
God is telling me to trust more. I've shared with you before when my husband came ill, we were the poster children for the recession because I made enough money to not qualify for any prescription assistance or any sort of assistance for him. I did not make enough money to pay for his illness and he was unable to work. Anyone who's ever had a catastrophic illness in their family knows what it is to come up against that financial difficulty. But it taught me more deeply to trust in God. I made Christmas presents to give away that year and people really appreciated what I had done. I baked bread and made jam and gave them jars of homemade jam and homemade bread and people said, how did you find time to do this? But it was a joy to do that because I wasn't concerned about what was going to happen to me at that point. Because there comes a point like the widow in the story where you just have to let go and let God take care of it all. It's hard to do though, isn't it? Because you might not have toilet paper. You might not have enough to survive. You may not be able to go to the movies or to go to the arcade or go to McDonald's whenever you want. It's a tough passage. But I think we have to deal with these tough passages, don't we? And again, don't think about money. I am never going to look at what you all give to the church. I don't do that. I'm never going to shame anyone for what they give. I had a finance chair in one of my churches. I hope to heavens the pastor who followed me did not put him back in that position. Because he did the math. And he said, you know what we're going to do here? He said, it takes $46 a head per Sunday to run this place. And I'm going to stand up Sunday and I'm going to say, if you don't give your $46, stay home. I said, you're not going to do that. And he said, how are you going to stop me? And I said, trust me. I will stop you from doing that. He said, it's only fair. And then I thought about a little lady named Anne Marie, who was the most giving human being I've ever known in my life, and she had very little to give. Anne Marie worked on every mission project we had. Anne Marie inspired people to give of themselves, not just with their resources, but to give their hearts, to give their testimony and their witness, to give their love to people they didn't know. She was the forefront of every mission project we had, and she always stood up and praised God for the faithfulness she had seen in the congregation. Well, one of the things we were doing at the church, we were doing a blessing of the bikes, not the bicycles, the motorcycles, the vroom vroom, the Harleys and the Hogs and everything else. And we were on our way to a meeting, and I picked her up, and I was driving her, and we passed a biker bar, which in Berkeley County, you can pass a lot of biker bars on your way to church. Motorcycles surrounded the place, and I said to her, Anne Marie, on the way back, we're going to stop there and invite him to church. To which she said, Oh dear, oh my, oh my, oh dear. I said, If you want, I'll buy a beer on the way out. And she said, Oh my, oh dear, oh dear, oh my. Well, we had the meeting, and I was driving her home, drove right by the biker bar, and she said, Aren't we stopping and going in? I said, Oh, honey, I was kidding. And she said, I would go if you wanted me to. But if she had been told she had to give $46, she'd never set foot in the church again. She didn't have $46 to give in a month or probably six months. She lived on a pittance. And sometimes we had to help her with her groceries. But the man who, Uncle, I'm going, this is going to sound judgmental, and it probably is. The man who said everybody had to give $46 owned a business that was very lucrative. So if we had said to everybody, you only need to give 46 to people who could afford to give much more, we would have cheated them out of the opportunity to give of themselves to God and to trust God. And we would say to the people who couldn't afford to give anything, you're not welcome here. But what if we took this as beyond money? What if you took the gospel and didn't store it away like toilet paper for a pandemic? But what if you shared it with everyone you met by showing them Jesus Christ, the one who lives in and moves in us and through us and works through us to bring peace and justice to this world? What if we shared the gospel? What if we shared ourselves? Mike is going to talk about mission next week, and Mike is going to share his heart for mission. And I tell you what, how many of you have ever been on a mission trip? You will be the one who comes back changed, am I right? You will be the one who comes back feeling like you have been given the greatest gift of your life because you've been given the opportunity to share with someone else. And you will see people with very little who would share their last cent with you. This pastor reminds me of a man in another congregation I served. His name was Francis. Francis had some sort of mental disability. We weren't quite sure what it was. He lived in a trailer with no running water. 
and he also worked in a factory, and I would drive him some places, and the smell inside my car was pretty incredible sometimes. I gotta tell you that, because he didn't have water to bathe with or to cook with. But the youth group went out one year and did the crop walk, crop church world service. They did a five kilometer walk for raising money for hunger. Most of it goes overseas, but some of it stays in the very community. One of the things they asked us to do was carry gallons of water with us to understand what it's like for people to carry gallons of water. Well, all these teenagers said, oh, I'll carry a gallon or two, give me two, and they made it about half a block and said, I'm not gonna do this, that's too heavy. Francis walked the whole way carrying two gallons of water. I said to him, Francis, you walk to work every day. He walked six miles each way to work. I said, you had to carry water just to drink in your house. I said, why are you doing this? And he said, because I know what it's like to be hungry. But he also knew what it was to trust God. And his heart belonged to his Savior. No one sang louder or more off-key in church than Francis. Please don't hear me saying, give money or die. Please don't hear me saying any gift is not too small. Please don't hear me say, give everything you have or you're not going to heaven. Pastors can scare people into all kinds of things. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying to you, give of yourself. Give your hearts. I've seen you give your hearts to each other. I've seen you give your hearts in mission. I've seen you give your hearts to the children in our daycare, in our Sunday school. I've seen you give your hearts away. Give them beyond. Keep reaching out farther and farther into the world with the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ. That's what's going to change this world. You are stored of all these things. You're stored of the financial resources you have, certainly. And I encourage you to the best of your ability to use them. Not necessarily here. Some of you give to missions beyond this congregation. And I'm not going to say you have to give everything here. But give what you can. Give your heart away. And you will see a greater return than you ever thought. Jesus told the disciples, it's easier for a camel to gallop through a needle's eye than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom. They were staggered. Staggered. And they said to him, then Lord, how is this possible? Jesus said, if you rely on yourself, it's not possible. But if you rely on God, you'll be amazed at what happens. Amen? Amen.